Well, welcome to this BNA 2021 session. Uh, this is going to be a really interesting session and one that I personally am going to find fascinating. Uh, interviewing Matt Eagles is going to be quite an unusual thing to do because, as you'll find, Matt is quite an exceptional person. He describes himself as a positivity activist. And the more you talk to him, the more you realize that this is a real thing. Uh, he's a patient advocate for Parkinson's disease, but he's so much more than just being a patient advocate. I think many of us in clinical medicine, whichever area we're in, are aware that a lot of patients find that being a patient can be very isolating, very lonely, uh, and a lot of people go into their own shell, which actually makes the disease process worse than it would be otherwise. Uh, Matt has had Parkinson's disease for a very long time. I will ask him about it and I'll ask him to tell you about his experiences of it. And then we can have a much more open discussion, all of us, about the way as a patient you can deal with the disease successfully uh, and make the very best of the potential outcomes that you can possibly have. I should say that Matt's very happy to have questions. And in fact, we would very much welcome questions from the audience. In fact, please, as Matt was saying, that this is basically, uh, you can ask every question that you might have wanted to ask about Parkinson's, but either have felt uh, restrained from asking it or not being able to ask it. So please feel open. Matt is uh, happy to answer anything about Parkinson's. So without any more further ado, I'd like to introduce Matt. And first of all, just to ask him a little bit about his original diagnosis of Parkinson's and how things have moved on since then. Welcome, Matt. Thank you ever so much, Stafford, and welcome everybody who's listening. Now, first of all, I must make a bit of a bit of a, a confession. If I suddenly disappear off the side of the screen, it's nothing to do with not liking Stafford or not liking the platform. It's really because I am actually so excited my dyskinesia is throwing me off my chair. But not to worry, I don't think that's actually gonna happen today. No. Thank you very much for inviting me onto this platform. Um, yeah, my Parkinson's, which I've lived with since 1975, and yes, I know I don't look old enough, um, affects my life in every possible way. Every little thing, for example, that you can do, you can do t during the day affects me. Everything you take for granted from getting up in the morning, getting out of bed, to having a shower, to getting dressed. I have to think very, very carefully about doing otherwise I could cause myself a mischief. So it's, it's a challenge, but it's one, as I've gone on, I've really kind of embraced really and I've and this might sound a little bit bizarre to say, but I think I'm very lucky to have lived with it for so long, simply because it's my every day. Every day is a new challenge. No one day is the, is the same as the next. So it's a challenge for me. And yeah, I choose, I've actually, over the years actually, I choose now to be happy because being sad isn't an option because it makes my symptoms so much worse. And being happy, as as because I have to confess to everybody that Stafford and I had a conversation last week and we just talked and talked and talked. And I couldn't stop grinning when I got off the call because he's such a nice guy. And if, you know... <laughs> I don't mean to get embarrassed or anything, but you're really so easy to get on with. So, yeah. So, can you do one thing uh, that gives a good feel for the sort of thing you're able to do? Is you, you told me a story uh, about you sitting, I come over there's a bus station or a train station, and you saw somebody. Oh, sitting yeah. there with my. I, I, th I think it just is a really good example of how your attitude and your understanding of what's going on around you is important. Do you, do you think you could tell the audience a bit about Abs that? Yeah, absolutely. 
One of my biggest worries about people with Parkinson's is they are afraid or embarrassed or ashamed even to go out in public and potentially fall over or be dyskinetic. Over the years, because I've had so much, um, I've been, I'm a, I'm a social butterfly, so I'm out all the time. Well, when I can, obviously. But this one particular day, I was at uh, the, um, the mobility station at Euston, waiting to be, uh, to be assisted onto the train. It was the assistance area. And I was very disconnected and I was trying, desperately trying to stay sat on the chair that I was sat on, but I kept on almost wriggling sort of downwards. So I nearly disappeared off my chair. But what actually caught my eye were a couple who were sat opposite me in the room who looked, were trying not to sort of look at me, but looked quite ashamed of themselves. And I was thinking, the guy started, I noticed had a resting tremor. And I know perhaps, possibly something I shouldn't have done, but I decided to anyway. I'd made up in my mind that this guy probably had Parkinson's. And as there was a seat next to him, I was going to introduce myself, whether he liked it or not, uh, and sort of say, hey, come on, it's not so bad. So in my inimitable way, I kind of sort of crabbed myself over to the air. Uh, to where he was sitting, in, and obviously asked if I could sit down. And I said to him, I hope you don't mind me asking you, but do you have Parkinson's? And he lifted his head very sort of slowly look, and looked sort of sideways to me and sort of said, yes, I do. And I sort of, my face lit up thinking, all right, a correct diagnosis by me. And I went, great, great, so have I. You know, and this, this said the lady next to him, who was clearly his partner or his wife, she sort of, be, they suddenly became animated. They had never, ever met anybody else with Parkinson's. He, they, he hadn't been diagnosed that long. And his only image of Parkinson's in his own mind, it turns out, was the image, uh, the image which was, I think it was designed by William Gower about 150 years ago. And that was his only view of, Park of what Parkinson's was or is. And that was why he, was, he didn't want to be associated with that image. Uh, anyway, as soon as, as soon as he found out that I was, I'd got Parkinson's too, it was almost like, great, we're both in the same club now. What can we do? What can we get up to? And he became, he became a different person and it turned out that He'd never really been directed to anything positive about Parkinson's. So after that meeting, I, I left determined that, A, nobody, nobody should ever be ashamed of whatever they, but not only Parkinson's, whatever, whatever, however different they are to anybody else, you should never, ever be ashamed and have to hide yourself because... You know that it's not. It wasn't his choice. He got Parkinson's, so why, why sort of, why suffer in silence? I hate what my hands doing, but it's getting very sort of uh, Trumpesque. <laughs> so I'm going to have to put my hand down to. Um, but no, it, it just goes to show it helps you suffer so much if you can just be yourself in public. I think this is a, it's a really important point that's for, for, for lots of diseases. I mean, I'm not a neurologist, but certainly in my own area of medicine, you know, people, when you give them a diagnosis, they initially think they're the only person in the world who's got it or the only person in the world they'll ever meet who's got it. And, and they're immediately totally isolated and they don't want to talk about it and, and they're embarrassed about it. So, I mean, how would you su suggest to somebody with a new diagnosis and actually or to their doctor, what should the doctor be doing and saying to the newly diagnosed patient? Because it's a sort of, uh, to some people, this is uh, the diagnosis when it's given to them it is sort of doom on a plate. Yeah. What I would suggest to the neurologist or, or, or whoever sort of diagnoses is 
it's not nice, but it isn't a catastrophe. There are ways in which you can have a positive experience with Parkinson's. Um, I mean, I'll give you an example. Many people are adverse to sort of asking for help or using a, using a walking aid. Now, in many respects, if that helps you to help yourself, then that's a good thing. Surely, therefore, you should adapt it. So I would say to a consultant, say there is help. There's some great, great help out there. Use it. Don't be afraid. It's not a sign of weakness to take to invest or take an interest in your own health. And in fact, the more you take an interest in your own health, the more you you can end up having like sort of a symbiotic relationship with your neurologist because the more interest you take, the more interest he may take or she may take in your own progress. I think this is becoming quite a big thing now, along with now we've been in lockdown, people are becoming so wet, so sort of frightened of their own mortality or so aware of their own mortality. And I think it's important to sort of say, listen, these things aren't great, but there is help out there. And do not be afraid. We're not there to sort of discourage you from going out or discourage you from doing things. Do things when you can and rest when you can. I mean, you're not going to be able to sort of climb, well, I'm going to say you're not going to be able to climb Mount Everest. However, a guy that I know is planning to do exactly that next year. But I think you have to just think, listen, it, you didn't, you've, not, you've not sort of voluntarily got this disorder or this disease or this syndrome. Do you just just be peaceful with it and give you give you be peaceful with yourself as well. There, we're getting a few questions here, Matt. So I'm just uh, having a look at them. Uh, one very quick one from Camilla was: uh, How old were you when you actually had the diagnosis? Right now, this this one's a bone of contention because my digital medical records actually say. On the 7th of November, 1975, Parkinson's. However, with it, with, with juvenile onset, which is incredibly rare, you ha they had to be so, so careful how they, how they sort of actually said the diagnosis. Because to be honest, at seven, I didn't really care what it was. I knew it was a massive inconvenience. And it really was my parents who were, uh, who, who I, I owe a lot to my parents because they must have carried the burden of this for many, many years. And they're both alive still. And I, 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 I was actually adopted at six weeks old and they've always been my parents as far as I can remember. So, They've had a massive burden to play. But yeah, I was seven, according to my digital medical records. I began on uh, L-Dopa therapy when I was eight. Uh, and I still take L-Dopa now. And I'm 52. So it doesn't... Well, you, I, I've got a little less hair than I had when I was seven. But um, apart, <laughs> apart from that... and. Uh, a little more, a little, a little less on my head, and a little bit more on my face. But uh, yeah, it was it was very unusual for that time in the seventies to be uh, to be even considered to have Parkinson's. Yeah, well, I mean, it was good that uh, they got the diagnosis because that was clearly important. Starting you on dopa then must have been really <laughs> amazing. Oh, can I, I must just said a little a little bit of story about that. I was actually given 50 pence when I was first given Cinemet to actually try it out. Now, I wish, I bet every patient wishes they, they were given the equivalent of 50 pence to try a medication. I'd be, if I, I worked out, by the way, I mean, I don't know, this might come as a bit of a shock to you guys out there. Over my Parkinson's journey, and I'm now into my 46th year, I 
worked out I've roughly taken 220,000 units of medication and it's still going up. So that's uh, that's one to consider, but it's it doesn't appear on the surface to be doing any me any harm at the moment anyway. We've got a, a question from uh, from Anne, and this is quite an important one because uh, we all, a lot of us, find it very difficult uh, if we aren't quite sure whether somebody's got a condition of what we should say. So, what 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 she's asking is: Has Matt got any advice or any messages he'd like to give about how people who might be nervous of getting it wrong should talk with or help someone with Parkinson's disease? What what are the do's and don'ts? That is such a good question. Um, quite often, I mean, I've had some instances where um, one, I was I was waiting with a at a Pelican Crossing with a walking stick, and I had my sunglasses on, and the guy just came up behind beside me and linked my arm, and thought I was blind, and helped me across the road. Some people can be really sort of funny about accepting help uh but my bit my what what i tend to do is i tend to thank them first of all say listen thank you so much for offering your assistance however everybody's different uh now if it, say for example if somebody said to me could they take my arm i'd, I'd have to decline very politely and say no because it, as soon as somebody else takes one side my body kind of rack, and I'm likely to fall to the up, <laughs> falling off my chair now, um, fall to the other side. It, but it's certainly, I, I mean, I'm always incredibly great. I'd far more, I'd, sorry, I'd much rather people asked if I needed help uh, than I didn't. But I also think don't don't get offended if people say no either. Um, some, sometimes people see everybody reacts differently to their own diagnosis I mean I, I can be walking down the street and see people watching me and I go it's okay it's okay everybody I've, I've got Parkinson's I'm not drunk or anything like that but other people find that incredibly difficult to do but yeah is there anything people, you shouldn't do is there anything we shouldn't do or say? Something that would that, that would make you upset? Well, no, not you nothing, up, <laughs> nothing upsets you. No, but... Nothing would upset me. But one thing, one thing that is very, very common, and um, it's because when you're staggering about looking with no sense of balance, it does look like you've had a drink. And people get very, very... People in the Parkinson's community sort of get very, very upset when they're when they're confronted with that, particularly with that phrase. Um, I actually wear a T-shirt, which I'm not sure whether I, can, uh, whether I can actually say what it says, but it's, can I? I don't know. It, it's uh, like... I think you have an adult audience here. Yeah, okay then. It says, I'm not pissed, I've got parkies. And that is probably one of the most engaging pieces of clothing I've ever worn. Because people just walk past you, they read what it says on the T-shirt, and they smile and they engage with you before you've even said anything to them. And I must tell you this story because I, I wore it quite often. At um, uh, I, I'm a big petrol head, and I go to Alton Park, our local racetrack, quite a lot. And I love meeting the the the, the British superbike riders, the British touring car drivers and they all know me around the paddocks have been going so much but since i've been wearing started wearing this particular t-shirt they all want photographs with me because they say aren't you brave and sort of isn't that funny but i think do you know it's far more easy to sort of get your message across on a t-shirt than having to explain to every tom dick and dick and harry that you know, you've you're wobbly because you've got Parkinson's. You haven't had a drink, but it is very, very engaging as well. Sounds like a brilliant T-shirt. Can, can I ask you? There's a question from Vinesh here, uh, which is it's in in the same sort of area. 
and, and that is, what would be the role of family members when somebody in the family is diagnosed with Parkinson's, given that the family is probably as devastated as the person being diagnosed? Yeah, th this, this is a particularly, particularly poignant one to me, actually. Uh, with my, my, my family, because I would say I was adopted, and the reason that I was actually, this is going to sound very ungrateful, but I was actually a second choice. And the reason my my adopted parents couldn't get their first choice was because the child had a, had a, had a, a disability. So obviously, when at such a young age I developed Parkinson's, they must have been devastated for me but, you know, I've never actually asked them because my upbringing was, I mean, if you bear in mind, I've come all through school having to, having to do exams. I managed, I tried to do sport when I could. Um, they, I think they, they were trying to encourage me to do everything that I possibly could do as a, a stroke, uh, a normal young lad growing up. But, um, and they did a good job, actually. And one of the reasons is they encouraged me to do all the things that, like sport. Uh, I was involved in speech and drama lessons because basically my mother hated my Northwest accent. So <laughs> from a very early age, I was a right, you're going to have elocution lessons because we don't like the way you're speaking. But no. That's helped me tremendously because I developed laryngeal dystonia, which made me sound like Barry White a lot of the time, which you might think is quite an attractive thing, but not all the time and not at the time when I was a telly sales rep. And <laughs> every every time I had a call, it was you sound like you've got you shouldn't be in, in work today. You've got you sound like you've got laryngitis. But um you know, it's one of those things. I mean one of the most disarming things I've ever uh, you can ever do, or the best things you can do for your for my family, is smile and be happy. I think that's ultimately all my mum and dad and my sister want me to be. They want me to be happy and and do the best I can. And I I owe them a and I shall I owe my my mum Meg and my dad Alan and my sister Nikki, and most of all my. My wife, Viv, I mean, she does a tremendous job. But I must add, actually, she 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 keeps me on the level because she let, I mean, as my mum and dad and my sister always happen, they, they sort of rip me mercilessly when I do something wrong. And they laugh at me and they have, they have a great sense of humour. And they don't let me be sad or rest on my laurels and sort of... It's like if I fall over, which I do regularly, wife will go to her and go, what are you doing down there? And I'll say, I'm the thing, the thing, and now sort of get up to get sort of get up using the furniture and then carry on. It's just one of those things. That, it is devastating for a lot of people in families, but I think if they can try and be as positive as they can, then, then that's that's a lot of the battle won. So are, are, are you saying in many ways that what they mustn't do is treat you with cotton wool? And, yeah, absolutely uh, not. I mean, that's no. a critical thing. Yeah, they, they should treat you just like they always have done. You might not be able to do... Well, the chances are you probably won't be able to do the thing, the things that you can. You'll get frustrated. But I think they've, they've got... Your family ultimately are the biggest strength that you can get. And uh, if they say, I really wish there was some, I mean, I don't know whether there would be, there'd be, um, there's a, there'd be a community set up for families of people who do have a Parkinson's diagnosis, actually. Because it's not just the patient that gets Parkinson's, it's all their family and their friends. Um, going back very briefly uh, to the to the sort of the embarrassment side of it, some people have lost friends when they've been diagnosed with Parkinson's, and I think that's shocking. And I think if you 
if you cannot accept as a person that somebody that you know has been diagnosed with something maybe you'd, you don't think it's a, you don't like or don't think it's appropriate then then you may be not the friend you thought you were Matt, I think it's a, a it's a it's a big problem in medicine this is that people don't know how to deal with and approach people with diseases so with with uh, the, you know this isn't just in Parkinson's disease uh, no. people are too embarrassed they don't know what to say and so so there is this danger of losing friends because uh, somebody sees you and they don't know what to say and they'll go to walk on the other side of the street just to avoid being a conversation yeah. having a conversation with you and that must be something that you have noticed I have noticed yeah I have but it's different for me because I don't I cannot remember it being any different uh, I've noticed it in other people but if people don't like me, then they don't like me. But I, my Parkinson's bizarrely makes me worry because I, 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 I try and treat every, and this isn't a cliche at all. I try and treat everybody nicely, it doesn't matter who they are or what they've done. And there is a psychological reasoning behind that. It's because perhaps if I see them again, I might need their help. Yeah. and that's my philosophy behind it so and likewise people might want me to help them and i would love to if i could but well let's move on to another question this yeah, is from, the next one is from a clearly a fan of yours who says it's always emma. a pleasure to hear you and this is from emma winnell who says matt what have been your best and worst experiences through your patient advocacy work my my best experience uh was actually at when I chaired a commercial pharma conference in London uh, as a patient advocate, and I was I did it alongside another patient, and we got a standing ovation at the end of the conference. Now Parkinson's, I'm sure you you guys that know, make can make you incredibly emotional. Uh, so I had tears running down my face because. Apparently, they'd never had um, people had give a give a, a you know a standing ovation to to presenters before at a commercial pharma conference, and I I think that was one of the most emotional experiences I've had. But on the back of that, the worst experience I've ever had was people then not acting on what they said they would do. Um, if that makes sense, because people people tend to promise a lot at conferences, and they have, and I'm sure there are great intentions, but for whatever reason, I get fulfilled, full of hope, and it's a parky thing. You get, you can, things get kind of exaggerated, and you can overthink stuff quite easily. And I thought I'd done a great job. They'd given me a standing ovation and things were going to happen. So, I, but I wanted them to happen like now or, or in the next few months, not without realizing that these things take changing behaviors, changing the way people think takes time. And so that, that was disappointing for me. But um, my, one of my best experiences actually was last December. On the very call, the British Neuroscience Association being awarded the uh, the award for the public engagement in neuroscience. I actually shed a tear then as well. Um, I do things because I have had such great support over the years. And I want to give back as much as I can. I feel a debt of gratitude. Um, and it, and I think it helps my condition to help other people anyway, if I can. Um, so, yeah. And say so it's lovely to hear from you. Uh, by the way, Emma, and good luck with all you're doing. Well done. <laughs> so we'll move on swiftly to yes. uh, Sarah Alders, who's asking, yeah. may I ask if in your experience, patient support groups 
include both familial and sporadic Parkinson's patients and families? Yes, they do. Um, there's a lo an awful lot of support groups out there. And I think as much as anything, the, par the world Parkinson's community is very inclusive. Um, certainly, everybody wants, I think it's a human thing, and you'll back me up on this, I'm sure, Stafford, from your own experiences around the world, people love to say they belong to a community and feel super proud of that. And so everybody's kind of represented in these community groups. Uh, I mean, some are more, the admins are more ruthless than others, but no, everybody, familial and sporadic PD patients and family, everybody's welcome in the vast majority of them. And they're all super friendly as well. Oh, that's good. So we have another question from Camilla Woodrow Hill. Which of your symptoms do you find interferes the most with your daily life? Now it's probably, well, <laughs> it's dyskinesia. Um, because when, you, when I'm dyskinetic, I mean, if you can imagine, and if you can imagine taking a shower when you're sort of dancing all over the place, it's incredibly difficult to do anything when you've got dyskinesia. Um, I wrote a bit. I wrote a piece for a, a, a healthcare agent. Uh, so, beg your pardon. Uh, for a lady called Beth Britton, who who's very famous in the dementia, well, famous blogger in the dementia world, and I said once in the bathroom having a shower can be impossible, despite having a grab rail in the shower itself. Our shower is over the bath but it's often too slippery, even with a mat, for me to wash safely. The first time the cold spray hits me, it sets my dyskinesia off and I end up dancing one-handed with my strictly partner, the white grab rail. And I, basically, I've got to be prepared to take a shower whenever I can, whenever I feel stable enough to. But this kind of, I mean, I have... This is the I mean this is the third office chair I've had this year. I've broken the others from regular I'm I'm very still at the moment, but that is quite unusual for me. Um but basically if you can imagine doing anything, trying to write, write trying to write, trying to use a keyboard when your hands are going all over the place. It is in in it eating you can I mean now I choose not to eat if I'm very dyskinetic, because otherwise, well, the dog sits very close to me. If if she can, it's funny because we have a chocolate Labrador and she loves sitting close to me. Uh, because sometimes I, I'll, I'll throw my food out, not deliberately, but it, or I'll pick up my knife and fork and suddenly go like that. This is what I use to drink a brew with, a thermos cup with a straw. It's not a plastic straw. You haven't seen that one. It's the one we're using up. And they're not, you're not allowed to, but they're the only ones that fit. Um, I would just, I've just noticed Camilla's put another caveat. Uh, are my dyskinesias much worse when you take your medic, my medication? Um, well, Camilla, I've actually been self-medicating since I was 10. So I know how my body's kind of feeling most of the time. That's my dog complaining in the background, actually. I don't know whether you heard her. But I get I tend to get emotional dyskinesias now as a response to certain situations, obviously. When I was a, the best way I can describe it actually is I don't know whether you're all familiar with dancing flowers that dance to when they when they hear the sound of it, the music. They're plastic flowers and they sort of get rocked to the music like that. Well, I, when I was actually, <laughs> clear enough, when I was waiting in the wet in the green room to come in, in on stage this afternoon, that was happening to me then. So also, I cannot hide my emotions either. So if somebody says something I don't, I don't agree with or 
I do agree with that sets off my dyskinesias as well. But yeah, if I, if if I am dyskinetic and I'm I am kind of due to take a tablet, I will I will not take it. But I have had deep brain stimulation anyway, fifteen years ago. So I I don't get that bad off periods, if you like. Although I, I do struggle to walk at all now, but um, I do I can get some way and some distance. So you're clearly a Labrador's best friend at mealtime. Yes. <laughs> Uh, honestly, I find bits of random. It's worse because um, I can, if I'm not careful, random pieces of like sort of bean or will end up on the wall, and I'll find it, and I won't realize I've done it. And my wife will find it when she's cleaning, sort of like a couple of days later, and look, how on earth has that got there? And then it will twig. But so the, your um, dog doesn't like beans. Well, no, it depends. I have to be baked a bit. No, she pretty much eats everything. Actually, she she's very cute. I do, I do. I'm very very fond of her. Can I move uh, move a little bit uh, a little bit sideways now? So I know that you have got a lot of interest in art and neuroscience. Yes. But I just wonder if you can just tell us a little bit about this. Yes. Um, Following the story that I told earlier on about the, the chap in the, in, in the Houston um, railway station about him being embarrassed about sort of showing his Parkinson's, one of the ways I actually deal with it myself, if I have a, I don't know, an awkward situation, is I try and write it down or type it down. And uh, I was at work one day and I was telling one of my colleagues about the fact, well, we have quite open discussions at work, so uh, I was thinking how difficult it was sometimes when I'm getting dressed. And I wrote it down, and I've, we, call, we called it the Parky Pants Dance. <laughs> and which base, it sounds a bit bizarre, but basically it means when you get dressed, stepping into your pants or your trousers or whatever can be exceedingly difficult. And quite often, I don't do it so much now because I try and take a little bit more care. But in my reckless days, I used to just try and put one leg in and I'd end up hopping around the room in with one leg in and one leg out and then end up in a heap on the floor, which my wife finds absolutely hilarious. So anyway, we're telling that story to one of my colleagues who's an excellent graphic designer and uh, illustrator. She actually illustrated that. And uh, we thought this, we thought we were all laughing. We thought it was brilliant and could be a thing. And we actually decided to gather up insights, to gather funny stories. And we'd illustrate them to sort of prove that, you know, you can make sort of situations that aren't so good feel, feel that you can make them feel, you, make, you can make, beg your pardon, you can make yourself feel a little bit better about situations that are potentially a bit awkward. So we, we kind of devised a project called Parky Life. Uh, and if if you want to have a look at Parky Life, it, the URL is www.parkylifeparkylife.com. And it's the brighter side of Parkinson's. Now, here, here is one particular slide. That represents walking sticks, good for a frozen gait, good for getting free seats on public transport. So there's a bit of humour there, but the art is fantastic. And we decided, we decided to highlight uh, people of note as well who've done interesting things, who've got Parkinson's. This particular card is Alan Older. The mash writer who's diagnosed at 79. This, but, uh, I shan't go through them all, but this is a hack. Play footy with your socks. If you can't move, kick some socks, roll them up, stick them between your feet and kick away. Guaranteed it'll get you moving and it'll also make you a lot of friends at the airport. Now, these are just brilliant pieces of, of art that have all been done individually by individual 
and some of them are pretty famous artists and illustrators from around the globe. No, no one image has been done by the same person. And the reason behind that is everybody's Parkinson's is unique. So we have a unique perspective. Now, I think the relation, it's quite interesting actually, because many Parkinson's people actually become incredibly creative. And there's there's a website called Parkinson's Art, I think it's dot com. And there are it, it appears appears to uncover a latent creativity in 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 people who get diagnosed with Parkinson's. And it could be writing poetry, it could be photography, it could be art doing art, but there's a definite but it makes people feel it gives them an enormous sense of well-being, and I think that if you, if you have been diagnosed with it with a with a chronic neurological condition, being happy and doing things that you like doing that are creative that have a a good response is absolutely crucial to your own mental well-being, and that again is crucial to how you manage your own disease. So you 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 have you seen the programs with Billy Connolly? Yes, I mean Billy. I love Billy's art. In fact, we have we do, Billy's one of the one of the Parky peeps actually, and this is his card. Oh, brilliant! That's fantastic. Have a look on the website because all these images are on the website, and he was diagnosed at seventy-one, and. It has on the back, so Big Yin, legendary comedian, musician, and entertainer. But we have all sorts of different cars. There's Parky Hacks, Parky Peeps, Parky Fun. There's funny, amusing stories. There's hacks, there's tips. But there's, they're all slightly humorous as well, without taking away from the serious nature of the condition. And there's nothing really like it. In the world, I've ta I've been lucky enough to take Parky Life on tour. I took it to the, I took it to, well, from Kyoto in 2019 to Chicago in the West, and everybody thinks it's a brilliant idea. And I actually believe in Parky Life so much that I've actually got the logo from the uh, from the website tattooed on my leg. You Which, don't have to show us. It's all right. No, <laughs> no, that would be quite difficult because I've got my stabilizer bars down on my chair now, so I can't actually move them fall off. So it would be quite tricky. Well, <laughs> yeah, no, I wouldn't. They, they, I'm up for a challenge, but not even standing on my chair actually for a minute. We'll Ooh. keep that for another time. So we've got another question. Do you want to read it from uh, Hannah Dorothy? Yes. America? First of all, I would like to thank Hannah incredibly for Hannah asked me to comment on her poster session. And I, her poster was influence of inhibition and visuospatial function on non symbolic magnitude comparison in Parkinson's. Now, I am not a scientist, but I took time to learn exactly what Hannah was talking about. And it took me a while, because, as, but I understand that it's brilliant. And what I would say, Hannah, uh, there are speed accuracy trade-offs to what to to the thing that you were doing. The quicker the quicker you try and respond to the parky patient, the less accurate you are. But are there anything you use to ease my symptoms? In intervention, yes, dancing, boxing. Any kind of mute movement is great, although I have to say it's very, very difficult if you try and do it with this kind of you can cause yourself bad injuries. But any kind of exercise, they found ballet's superb, Pilates is great. Any any movement that keeps you moving, uh, yeah, the ballet. Uh, and bizarrely, tango dancing. Tango is, dancing? Yeah, wow. tango dancing is supposed to be incredibly good for your balance. Boxing, there's boxing therapy. But um, again, 
I find, I mean, I've that gets out a lot of tensions as well because I've actually found over the years that because I've had Parkinson's for such a long time and it is hard on it, tough on the body, but my body, my shoulders, my arms, my back and my biceps are strong. So I was able to hit quite hard when I was boxing. So I, I and I've always, fa I always fancied myself as a bit of a, a bit of a, I was going to say a, a Mike Tyson, but I don't at all know. I just wanted, I just wanted to be able to beat away Parkinson's, if you like. So it gives you an enormous sense of well-being. But yeah, just keeping active, Hannah, is the key. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Just keep just keeping active and, and trying to learn. Don't. I mean, I've been lucky enough to travel a lot. Don't be confined by the fact that you might need assistance, for example, at an airport. Because people are only too willing to give you a hand. So, yeah. Uh, do we have another question from Camilla? From do you Camilla think Woodrow, Woodrow Hill. Shall I read it out? Because it's quite a long one yeah. for the audience. Because uh, the audience can't see this. Uh, do you think that watching of movement you want to perform, e.g. someone drinking from a cup or undoing shirt buttons, etc., might help you perform the movement yourself? In the same vein, if you were to imagine yourself performing a movement su or successfully, do you think this might be helpful in for improving your ability to perform the movement? This is related to my own research. Any insight appreciated? It's just kind of mirror it, mirror it. I beg your pardon, mirroring the kind of oh. the movement. Because I think to a lot, I know for a, for a fact that if I'm with a load of parky people who are dyskinetic, it sets off my dyskinesia. So, and I tried desperately, but yeah, seeing how other people do things in real time, yeah, it can really help you. Uh, because also, you're focusing, you're trying to focus your mind. If you're watching somebody, I mean, doing buttons up and just just drinking from a cup can be, if you, I think it would work, in, certainly work in slower motion as well. I think real time, there's all, learning from others and watching others is something we do inherently as humans anyway from a very very early age i think so yeah i think that's that your own i think i mean i'll give you an example of, kind of, of how watching things can help my son avidly plays fifa on his playstation now some of the most popular videos on youtube are people playing fifa themselves my son will learn from watching how others play the game so in that respect i would very much conclude that yes you you can learn a lot from watching how other people um really sort of attempt to task and learn from that yeah absolutely yeah can i uh, one of the things that uh, hannah asked was whether or not uh there are any aspects of Parkinson you would like to see more research done on? There's ve there's so many different symptoms and um, both motor and non-motor that, that come up. The this kind, I mean, I would love to have a CNN to this kind this kinesia. I really would. I wish I could block it out completely, but in fact. I know there are ways of doing this because when I know this might sound strange, but I've recently, well, no, it's nearly a year ago, year last February, I had my third battery in, uh, I, had, I had deep brain stimulation 15 years ago. And this time, instead of having a, I don't know. Am I allowed to mention the, the Medtronic and Boston? Oh, yes. Scientific? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, I've got Medtronic electrode in my head and a Medtronic wire, but now I have a Boston Scientific pulse generator. And it's it's quite bizarre. On the first settings that I was put on post-surgery, I had no dyskinesias. And for a certain period of time, I was totally okay again. And this, to me, was an absolute revelation. It proved it could be done. 
However, very soon after experiencing, I, I must it must have been about like a half an hour of what I would consider back to normality that I hadn't had for like 40 odd years, I crashed and went worse than I'd ever done. I couldn't even crawl on the floor. Uh, I couldn't, I struggled to get into a wheelchair. It was just so difficult. So the settings I'm on now, I had to go back down to the hospital actually and get reprogrammed. But I, unfortunately, having this kind of is, is like a hazard of the job, if you like. Because although I still get this kind of easier on these settings, I can, st my voice is a lot stronger than it was. Um, and it, I guess it's just something that I kind of, it's a hazard of the job, I guess. You know, I, I feel a lot better in myself mentally. I can't, as you can probably see, I can't stop grinning and I'm getting all sorts of wrinkles by my eyes because I smile so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that, that. That's a good reason. Yeah. So so, there's uh, Sarah Aldous want, wants to know whether having had uh, Parkinson's from such a young young age has given you problems with um, with employers. I mean, basically, are employers understanding? Um, <laughs> once you're there, yes. In most, in my experience, I mean, I was very lucky. Um, however. When you're looking for a new job, and this is, and I don't know why it's the case, but I've, I've, I've done a lot in my life. I've been incredibly lucky. So my, my curriculum vitae is very good, I'd like to think. But if I put, I've got Parkinson's disease on it, it'll instant my CV, if I had to just send it in, if the man there hadn't met me or hadn't known anything about me, would be instantly put to the bottom. And I refused to accept this. A lot of my friends were saying, listen, Matt, great CV, but take off, you've got Parkinson's. And I said, well, no, I'm not going to, I refuse. If these guys don't want to call me in for an interview based on what they've read, then they clearly then I, then they're clearly not the company that I want to work for. Uh, I think honesty, transparency goes a long, long way. Um, and I think people with Parkinson's. I mean, I'd never get a job as a window cleaner, for example. And I remember, I actually remember as, as an eight-year-old being in, being told that, being told I could never be a window cleaner. And it didn't really hit me at the time, but, you know, or a job, and he said, a window cleaner or a job climbing ladders. But it is tricky. And one of the, I think one of the hardest things for me, Sarah, was, oh, what's happened there? Oh, you're, fun you're functioning okay. We can hear you and see you. Oh, can you? Oh, right. Oh, I've just, I must have just clipped. Right, there we go. That's better. I know I just clicked off my own screen, oh. but um, no, doing doing. I did a law degree down in the City of London Polytechnic, and that was one of the toughest things I've ever encountered because when you do a law degree, as a, and I'm sure every, a lot of other degrees are very similar, you have to do a lot of writing. And my law exams, I passed my first year. I did an LLB honours degree in business law, so it was an LLB honours in law plus a business aspect as well. But in my second year, I had to write five essays in four hours. Oh my God. The only difference being I couldn't write and I had to dictate them to a guy sitting next to me who was younger than me, whose handwriting I didn't recognise. Uh, and it it was a nightmare, and eventually I just got fed up with the whole system. I mean, it's not really like me to, to get fed up, but I just got so fed up with actually the whole system that I I got asked to vacate my place on the course. So it can oh. be desperately frustrating, but um, I think I've come out I've come out of it okay. So it hasn't been easy yep. either. 
hasn't been easy, but can, can I ask you something that, that, that interests me? Because you you've travelled a lot, yeah, yeah, uh, and uh, and and I I've always been very interested in the commonalities of different populations yeah. around the world, and despite the cultural differences, the basic humanity of people is very similar where wherever you are. I just wonder whether you have found a different response of different populations to Parkinson's disease in the different countries you've been to? Yeah, well, it, it, it's funny you should say that, actually, because I'm, say I'm very, very lucky in, in where I've travelled to. And I'll give you one example. Uh, I was waiting in a... I'd taken a wheelchair. I'd gone from Kathmandu to, to Delhi. Not in my wheelchair all the time, by the way. I went uh, all over flying and I took to, went on all sorts of different ways, but people in India have a, and I think other Asian countries have a slightly more, how can I put, inquisitive way of looking at you. Um, but I mean, it, once you know how people, people are sometimes interested by the unknown and they want to learn. I think what I have learned is, Nowhere have I gone where people are not prepared to jump in and help me. No. Which is which is a ba I mean, I think it's a basic human human kind of nature, I think. And again, um you'll you you'll be able to back me up on this one. Helping people gives you people an enormous sense of well being. Yeah, definitely. So and that that is universal. I mean, in your in your sort of um, experience in, in in the Amazon, did you find that if you were allowed to help, you know, with the, these Indian tribes that you you were living with, the day the day, the bet they appreciated it, and obviously it gave you a sense of pride in help, being able to help them. I you know, I'm guessing. Yes, definitely. I mean, there were some cultural aspects that you had to be very careful of which yeah you know you, you you mustn't make out that you are you are better than they are and that your science is better than theirs but if you're just there to help then then that's that's absolutely fine but it's encouraging to me because it it suggests that you know people with parkinson's i'm, I'm sure a lot, a lot of people would be worried about traveling and going on holiday and worried that people at the other end wouldn't wouldn't understand and and they wouldn't wouldn't be helped and basically you're saying this is you must be sensible but actually people will be understanding and help yeah i think if you if you try if you sort of if you react in like a negative way to people staring at you, then then you might not get the help that you're looking for. But if you sort of take it on board that, hey, yeah, I mean, I take a step back and think, it must be, when I watch myself on videos walking, when I think, God, it must be really strange seeing a guy like that walk up to you. So if I think it's bizarre seeing myself, then it must be the very same for other people. And I think, you know, we need to, people with people with chronic disease need to maybe take, have a think about how they they are perceived themselves. Think, hey, oh, that's how I, maybe video them something and say, that's how I look. So people are naturally curious. And as I say, I always get my sort of, I was like, it's okay, I've got Parkinson's because you can tell people are watching you. But that is natural cur human curiosity. Yeah. It's not nastiness at all. And if it is, you just, well, you just don't engage. So it's okay, I've got Parkinson's. Matt, we've been talking, if you've been talking for uh, over about an hour and five minutes. Oh, gosh. Uh, and... No, it's been it's been fantastic. Uh, you've given us so much insight in what it is like to live with Parkinson's and uh, how you how you can deal with it in in a very positive manner. I mean, I I love the idea that uh, you're a positivity activist. You clearly <laughs> are. It's very clear to all of us that, that that you are, and you're very successful at it. And I think the Parkinson's community should be very grateful that uh, there are people like you who can help them. So just to end it, are, are, is, is there any 
final message that you would like to put across before we we end this chat? Yes, first of all, I mean, when you have a, when you are diagnosed with a condition, I think yeah, you have a choice. Uh, you can either choose to embrace it and live with it as positively as you can, or sometimes you might not wish to do that. But I would encourage you to. There are so many things you can do that are positive with whatever whatever with whatever sort of cards you dealt. And I would choose positivity every time because I'm not very good at being sad. So try not try try not to be sad. It's not bad, but try try not to be sad all the time. And try and smile. Because if you smile, other people smile. And it's so infectious, it really is. So I'd encourage say try and just smile. I'll do my best. <laughs> that, that's a fabulous way to end our, our chat. I've really enjoyed it. The audience has really enjoyed it. I'd like to thank you very, very much indeed. I'd also like to thank backstage, both Kieran and Hannah backstage, who's made sure the whole of this has worked so well. But yes, thank you keep, keep so it. much. Th um, my the pleasure. BNA, the BNA are really, really grateful to you. And we'd all like to wish you very the very best for the future. Thank well, Stafford, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody in the audience. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. It is very much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.